Hello, in this video I'm going to give a brief introduction to economics and then do a little review of the 10 key principles as explained by Mankiw. So economics is the study of choices people make to cope with scarcity. The two key ideas in this definition are choices and scarcity. And I'll get back to that in a second. Another way we can just simply think of economics, it's just the study of how people respond to incentives, changes in costs and benefits. Economics is a social science. It's a study of human behavior. Economics is not solely about how to become a successful Wall Street investor or how to strike it rich by being an entrepreneur. Now, the things that you learn in economics can certainly help you in those endeavors, but economics is much more broader than simply uh, how to pick winning stocks. So, as I mentioned here in the first definition, there's two key ideas here, choices and scarcity. So, scarcity. Uh, resources are scarce. This is the world we find ourselves in. Land, labor, capital. Capital in economics refers to machines, offices, factories, earth-moving equipment, computers, and so on. Um, and natural resources. All of these things are limited by nature. So that means people cannot satisfy all their wants because we live in this world of scarcity. So again, just to summarize, we live in a world of scarcity, so we cannot get everything that we want. As a result, scarcity forces us to make choices. That's the choice part of this definition. So given that we can't have everything that we want, how are we going to spend our limited income? What goods are we going to produce? We can't produce everything, so what are we going to produce? And how are we going to spend our time? Don't confuse scarcity with poverty. Poverty is a lack of basic life necessities like food, shelter, clothing, for example. We will never overcome scarcity. Perhaps one day no one will be living in absolute poverty or extreme poverty, but scarcity will be with us till the end of time. So let's go through Mankiw's 10 principles, 10 key ideas that will be themes that will be reoccurring throughout this uh, course throughout this textbook. So the first key idea is trade-offs. Choices and actions involve sacrifice. <coughs> to do one thing means doing less of something else. Studying for an exam means there's less time to watch Netflix. There's a trade-off. Spending money on a new car means less money to spend on something else. Using resources to clean the environment means fewer resources to do something else. Green jobs are not a benefit of cleaning the environment, but a cost. The cleaner air or water is the benefit. The green jobs or those workers that do the job are no longer producing other things. That represents a lost opportunity. That's the trade-off. So green jobs represent a cost of producing cleaner air or cleaner water. COVID lockdowns, again, in terms of trade-offs, may lead to fewer people dying of COVID, but may increase the number of people dying from other causes, substance use, suicide, these uh, deaths of despair. Uh, it could lead to a lack of health treatment for cancer, heart disease, and so on. Not to mention people suffering from mental health issues, from not seeing loved ones. All right, let's move on to principle number two. That is opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is a thing that must be given up to obtain an item. Or sometimes uh, textbooks will call it the highest valued alternative for gone as a result of making a choice. So before you do something, ask, what will I be giving up in order to undertake this action? So the opportunity cost of going to watch a movie in a theater, it includes the price of a ticket. You could have spent that money on something else. It's the travel cost, uh, the time sacrifice watching the movie. So those are the things sacrificed in order to watch a movie. Opportunity cost tells us you are likely too poor to keep a free Bentley. The opportunity cost of driving a Bentley is $200,000, the money you could have in your bank account if you sold the car. 
So are you really that rich to be driving around a Bentley? Consider what you could be doing instead, selling the car and having $200,000 in your bank account. Uh, the best and brightest should not be teachers. That is an opportunity cost idea. The world would not be a better place if Paul McCartney, instead of making music, was a music teacher, or if Bill Gates uh, was a elementary teacher instead of uh, being the founder of Microsoft. Key principle three, rational people think at the margin. People behave in a manner using all available information that is consistent with maximizing their objective. So this is a notion of rationality. So people do things because it's in their interest of doing things. Uh, and people's objective could be all kinds of things, making lots of money, helping the poor, uh, trying to um, have a big family, exploring the world, having a lot of leisure time, et cetera, et cetera. So rational people will respond to costs and benefits of their actions in predictable ways. So if the benefits of doing something increase, rational people would most likely do more of it. On the other hand, if the cost of doing something increase, that will deter rational people from wanting to do as much of that activity. Uh, so there's this notion of rational criminals. What are they, what is rational criminals? Uh, it's not saying that these people are you know, virtuous or doing something morally correct. It's just rational criminals will weigh the benefits and cost of committing crime. So if the benefits of committing crime increase, you're likely to get more crime. If the cost of committing crime increase, you're likely to get less crime. So that is a notion of uh, applying this rational principle to criminal activity. So thinking at the margin, so principle three, again, rational people think at the margin. So what is this margin? So should we hire additional workers? Should we produce a little bit more output? Should I have an another slice of pizza to eat? Should I take an additional course this semester? Should I study a little bit more for my exam? Should I reread the chapter one more time? Should I work additional hours? These are all things, decisions that are made on the margin. And when making decisions, rational people will compare the marginal benefits versus the marginal cost. So the marginal benefit is just the additional benefit of doing one more unit of an activity. The marginal cost is just the additional cost of doing one more unit of an activity. So if a CPA firm hires an additional tax accountant, the marginal benefit will be that the firm will be able to complete more tax returns, increasing the firm's revenue. The downside is the marginal cost. The firm will have to pay this account, so the compensation paid. So if the benefits outweigh the cost, it makes sense to hire an additional tax accountant. Studying an additional hour for an exam, marginal benefit, likely to get a higher exam score. The marginal cost, you could have been doing something else with your time. There could also be a psychic cost. You don't like this material. It's dreadful. It's boring, etc. So that would be included as part of the cost of studying for one more hour. If the benefits outweigh the cost, it makes sense to study for an additional hour. Cleaning the environment. The marginal benefit is that fewer people will get sick or maybe develop cancer over their lifetime. The marginal cost, the resources used to clean the environment could have been used elsewhere. They could have been used to provide more health care, more education. Uh, national defense, it could have been used for fighting crime, building housing, you know, a whole host of things. In economics, efficiency requires doing something up to the point that the last unit of the activity provides just as much added benefit as added cost. Again, this is just marginal thinking. So an efficient outcome is doing something up into the point where the marginal benefit equals marginal cost. You want to keep studying additional hours for an exam up to the point where the benefit of the last hour studied just equals the cost of the last hour studied. So an inefficient outcome could be one of two things, not doing enough of the activity. So the marginal benefit exceeds the marginal cost. We should likely be doing more in this case. So if the additional benefit of increasing safety by a little bit exceeds the additional cost, then safety should be increased. So firms can increase safety, let's say, at a cost of $2 per hour a worker works. 
workers value the increased safety at a benefit of $3 per hour. So here the marginal benefits outweigh the marginal cost. So in terms of uh, improving efficiency, it would make sense to add a little bit more safety to the workplace. The benefits outweigh the costs. On the other hand, we could get an inefficient outcome by doing too much of an activity. So in economics, you can do the right amount, too little or too much. And this would occur where the marginal benefit is less than the marginal cost. So we don't want to be doing something up to the point where the marginal benefit is less than the marginal cost. So let's say firms are required to increase safety at a cost of $2 per hour a worker works. But this time, let's assume that the workers value this increased safety at a benefit of $0.75 cents per hour. So this here would be a situation where the benefits of added safety don't outweigh the cost. Okay, so this would not be making uh, the workers and firms collectively better off. It would be making them worse off. So economics of marginal thinking, again, tells us you can do too much of something, too little of something, or just the right amount of something. It is possible for the environment to be too clean, for example. It is possible for there to be too much safety in the workplace, like my example up here. Um, so economists reject the idea that one can never be too safe. There is an efficient amount of there is a, an efficient amount of safety. There's an efficient uh, level of cleanliness in the environment. We don't want to keep cleaning the environment up into the point where the marginal benefit is less than the marginal cost. Keep in mind, we live in a world of scarcity. Okay, so when the marginal benefits are less than the marginal cost, those resources are likely to be put to better use elsewhere. Principle four, people respond to incentives. If the benefit of doing something increases, people will do more of it. If the cost of doing something decreases, people will um, do more of it as well. If the price of chicken rises, people will buy less chicken. This is just people responding to incentives. Laws may create incentives that lead to unintended consequences. So the Endangered Species Act may cause landowners to make their land inhospitable for in the endangered species, cutting down trees, clearing, uh, clearing brush, and so on. Increased vehicle safety may cause people to drive more recklessly. Banning plastic bags at the grocery stores may cause people to buy more plastic bar uh, garbage bags to use for dog poop and other household trash, leaving the amount of plastic bags and landfills virtually unchanged. Principle 5. Trade can make everyone better off. A trade doesn't take place unless, unless both parties stand to gain. Trade is not a zero-sum game. It's not like the Super Bowl where one team wins and the other loses. If a buyer buys a car for $5,000, the buyer values the car for more than the $5,000. The seller values the, the, the dollars, the $5,000 more than she values the car. Both parties benefit. Only people trade. Countries do not trade. Only people within and across countries trade. Trade makes us richer. What would your family's standard of living be if it had to consume only the things it produced? So if your family didn't trade, in other words, it was self, completely self-sufficient, that means it would have to produce its own housing, own food, own health care, own transportation, own clothing. You would be pretty poor. Okay, so what we do in the modern world is we tend to specialize and then trade with others out in the market who specialize in other things. Keep in mind the U.S. is one big tree free trade zone. Would Pennsylvania uh, be richer if we prevented uh, uh, people in Pennsylvania from trading with people in Florida or California, Texas, or so on? No. Just like your family would not be richer if we prevented your family from trading with others out in the marketplace. Number six, markets are usually the best way to organize economic activity. 
So a market economy is a decentralized system. It's an organic system. It, what, it's what arises naturally. There's no one in charge. In a certain th- sense, we can think of a market economy as a language. Who's in charge of the language or developing a language? It's just it, what arises naturally. So again, think of a market economy as kind of organic in that sense. Uh, so a decentralized system in which households and firms interacting in markets determine what to produce, how to produce, and who will get what is produced. The key factors to a market economy are market-determined prices. So a market is just a group of buyers and sellers for a good. So there's a market for textbooks, which includes the publishers and sellers of textbooks, includes all the college students and others who buy textbooks and so on. There's a market for cars. There's a market for corn, uh, there's a market for tennis shoes, and so on. So there's all these markets that buyers and sellers interact in. So in a market economy, prices are determined in markets, and that helps eliminate balance, uh, imbalances such as shortage of surpluses. You'll notice that our markets are generally not plagued by shortages. You're generally, oh, I hope I can find some chicken this week, or hopefully I can find some cereal this week. It, it's generally there. Uh, Another key factor of markets is profit maximization. This gives an incentive for firms to develop better products, to better serve their customers, to economize on scarce resources. Private property. Uh, Market economies are characterized by private property, uh, where the means of production are not owned by the government, but owned by private individuals, households. And this gives an incentive to invest, to take care of your property that you own, Um, as uh, workers, uh, you have an incentive to invest in human capital that'll increase your skills and productivity and hopefully lead to higher wages. Um, So in the market economy, it is said that firms produce what consumers want as guided by an invisible hand. This is the idea by Adam Smith. He's the founder of economics who wrote a famous book, The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. And you can still buy copies today on Amazon. So firms have an incentive to produce what consumers want. Uh, If they're not producing what consumers want, they're not going to sell much product and they're not going to have very high profit. Likewise, in this market economy, firms try to produce efficiently. They want to minimize the cost for producing any given level of output. Why would they do that? Well, again, it's sort of as an invisible hand guides firms to produce efficiently. Firms will have an incentive not to waste resources. Wasting resources, using more labor, more steel, more raw materials than is necessary to produce a product will reduce a firm's profit. So again, in this market economy, firms have an incentive to produce what consumers want and to do so efficiently. Uh, In terms of the last question, who will get the goods produced in a market economy? It's going to be determined by incomes. Uh, Those with higher incomes will be able to command more goods and services. Um, As I mentioned, Adam Smith, uh, he argues that people are generally self-interested. And if you go back to our definition about people that are rational, you know, people do things because they're trying to maximize their objective, some objective that has a notion of self-interest in it. So Adam Smith, um, in a a kind of profound idea, said uh, self-interest is consistent with the public's interest. So what did he mean by this? He said, firms are self-interested profit maximizers, but to maximize profit requires producing what people want and producing it efficiently by not wasting scarce resources. So by following your own self-interest here, you're actually benefiting others, producing what other people want, consumers in this case, and doing it at the lowest possible cost. After all, we live in a world of scarcity and we don't want firms hoarding resources, using more than necessary, because that means less resources for everybody else. Uh, Let me just uh, do a a quick detour here about the importance of price or importance of prices in a market economy. Market prices allocate scarce resources. A high price gives consumers an incentive to buy less of a good. Maybe seek out substitutes. So if the price of chicken rises, well, what can I eat instead of chicken? Oh, maybe beef, maybe pork, maybe ramen noodles for that matter. A high price gives firms an incentive to bring more 
of the good to the market. A higher price, all, all else being equal, means firms will be able to generate more profit, so they'll have an incentive to bring more to the market. Uh, prices adjust to bring harmony between the amount that consumers want to buy and sellers want to sell. We're going to spend a lot of time on prices in, uh, let's see, Chapter 4, I believe, yes. If a resource is undervalued, this could be workers or land, its price will eventually be bid up. So again, the importance of prices and allocating resources. I also want to mention here, prices, uh, uh, prices reflect the opportunity cost of bringing a good to the market. It makes sense in New York City to buy tomatoes produced across the country, say in California, than produced locally. The price of a locally grown tomato would be quite high, reflecting the high land prices in New York City. To use land in New York City for farming, for example, you would need to bid that resource, that land away for more valuable uses, office buildings, office space, and so on. So it makes sense then to buy these tomatoes from across the country. Uh, in terms of, sort of evidence about uh, the uh, success of market economies, here's a table showing that uh, countries that tend to have uh, more market-based economies, uh, the people are much richer there compared to countries that have less uh, economic freedom or rely less on market economies. So what's the opposite of a market economy? The polar opposite uh, is what we can refer to as central planning, uh, communism, uh, socialism for that matter. So a centrally planned economy is where the government or government bureaucrats are essentially going to make all the key economic decisions, what to produce, how to produce, who will get what is produced. So those decisions are determined uh, collectively by central planners. They're not determined by, uh, they're not determined in markets by groups of buyers and sellers interacting. Uh, prices are going to be largely set by government officials. They're not going to be set in marketplaces. As a result, these uh, centrally planned economies were generally plagued by shortages. Uh, the former Soviet Union uh, back in the 1970s the, the, the accepted norm was that women, women would spend roughly 14 hours a week in line waiting to buy groceries because of just a massive shortages of basic food uh, items. There are shortages of apartments, shortages of cars, and so on. Again, we'll talk more about that later in the course. Uh, so by and large, centrally planned economies were disasters. Uh, most economies uh, have been moving away uh, from uh, th uh, this, uh, uh, <clears throat> this type of uh, economy. Uh, central planners simply lack the knowledge. They don't have a price system, uh, so they just simply lack the knowledge on what to produce, you know, what do consumers want to consume. Uh, without prices, it's hard to know how to produce efficiently. If you didn't have prices, does it make sense to produce a tomato in New York City or California? Uh, it's going to be very difficult to determine that. Number seven, uh, Basically, markets aren't perfect, so governments can sometimes improve market outcomes. So some key roles for the government is to provide a rule of law to protect private property rights, uh, establish a police and court system to provide a level of national defense, and also address perhaps market failures. So markets are not perfect. Market failure occurs when resources are allocated inefficiently. Uh, some sources of market failure are market power. So market power is a, a single firm or maybe a small group of firms that exert substantial control over, uh, this is, should say, market prices, okay, or for the market process for that matter. But uh, market power is basically having substantial control over market prices. Another market failure is an externality. This is an action by a person that creates spillover benefits or costs to others. So pollution is a classic example of a negative externality. So a firm, a firm is producing a product, and some of the costs of producing that product are pollution that uh, other people in society are bearing the cost of. Uh, 
Another example here, going to the grocery store while sick with COVID creates a negative externality. Your actions are creating spillover costs to others. You might be spreading the disease to third parties, bystanders. Uh, asking in a question in class could be an example of a positive externality. Not only do you benefit from having your question answered, but so do your classmates. Having a well uh, manicured lawn or nice landscaping. Not only do you benefit from that, but your neighbors get the benefit as well by looking at it. it might increase their property values as well. Principle eight, a country standard of living depends on productivity. Uh, productivity is just simply the amount of goods produced from each unit of labor. This is the most important determinant of our long run economic well-being. Uh, I'll have more to, we'll devote a separate chapter to principle number eight uh, later on in the course. Principle number nine, price, uh, uh, should say prices rise when the government prints too much money. Prices rise when the government prints too much money. Uh, and when the average level of prices is rising in the economy, that is referred to as inflation. And principle number 10 in the short run, there's a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. So these last three, I'm not going to go too much more detail in these. We're going to spend you know entire chapters on these concepts later on in the course. All right, uh, that's it for my brief introduction.